And I'm doing the best that I can While my way is so hard You know I just don't understand opportunity as we look to this word coming out of the book of Joshua, the seventh chapter, verses one through five. I want to say thank you again to our ushers at the door. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing in the sound and also our greeters and everyone that's 
doing work in the nursery. Let me say something about the nursery. Let's give God praise for those who are working Amen. in the nursery. Amen. If y'all can hear me, just wave. If you can hear me, just wave. Amen. Well, they're busy over there. I can see that now. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, we are glad to, uh, again, if you get to John, uh, Joshua 7, Joshua 7 is coming up on the screen. Joshua 7, if you would like to stand, you may do so in the reading of the word today. Joshua chapter 7 and verse number 1, we'll be reading down to verse number 5. This is the New Living Translation. Hear what the word has to say to the people of God. But uh, Israel violated the instructions about the things set apart for the Lord. A man named Achan was, had stolen some of the, these dedicated things, so the Lord was very angry with the Israelites. Achan was the son of Carmi, uh, descendant of Zarai, and son of Zarah of the tribe of Judah. Joshua sent some of the men from Jer Jericho to spy out the town of Ai, east of Bethel, near Beth Haven. When they returned, they told Joshua, there is no need for all of us to go up there. It won't take more than two or 3,000 men to attack Ai. Since there are so few of them, don't make all the other people struggle to go up there. And verse 4 says, so approximately 3,000 warriors were sent, but they were soundly defeated. The men of Ai chased the Israelites from the town gate as far as the quarries, and they killed about 36 who were retreating down the slope. The Israelites were, uh, were, were paralyzed with fear as this turn of events and their courage melted away. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. So it was approximately 3,000 warriors that went, were sent, but they were soundly defeated. And today we want to speak uh, on the subject today, lessons learned from defeat. Lessons learned from defeat. One more time. Lessons learned from defeat. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we come uh, to you, our strength, our joy, our love, the one who loved us so much that you gave us Jesus Christ, Jesus who loved us so much he gave us life. And so we come today asking you to just come and lead this this preaching time. Lead it, direct it, and guide it. Let it, these words fall on fertile soil and help us all to learn how to learn from these lessons of defeat uh, that we see in Israel. Bless us and keep us. We love you and we adore you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and let all the saints of God say amen. amen. You know the story. I started on this message a couple of weeks ago with the Lord uh, led the Joshua and the Israelites to a great victory uh, in the town called Jericho. Now, if you know anything about Jericho, you would know that it was a large town. Not only was it a large town with a large population, but they had a large wall that was protecting the town. And to find out a little bit, little bit more about Jericho, you can find that in Joshua 6, 1. It says, now the gates of Jer Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go in or to come out. And uh, right here, before they go, before the people of Israel uh, were to go to Jericho, uh, God gave Joshua some instructions. And this is what he told his, uh, told his people to do. He says, I want you to get your soldiers together and, and make sure you have the uh, seven priests in the front and also have the Ark of the Covenant in the front. And what we're going to do is march around Jericho walls one time each day for six days. Everybody still here with me? So they did that. They marched around Jer Jericho walls for six days. But then the Lord gave some other instructions. He says, on the seventh day, I need the seven priests and all the people to march around. And on that seventh time, he said, the priest would sound the alarm and the people would give a great shout. And he, and, uh, he said, the walls will come down. Do you know that they had enough nerve to believe God? Can I get some help in the house? They believed God and they walked around and they walked around and on that seventh time that they walked around, they shouted and the sound of the trumpet and guess what happened? The walls of Jericho came down. And I came to let somebody know here today that that was a great 
great victory for the Israelites. But then we see some things are changing, the tides are turning, and now we see that uh, they have a turning point because not only did they, take, they, they handle uh, Jericho, they kind of began to think that AI was going to be an easy place. Amen. And so they went to AI as the next city. Now, AI was a little different than Jericho because it had very few people. Amen. And they didn't have any walls around AI. And so what the people were beginning to think is that this is going to be easy. Can I get some help in the house? This, uh, uh, we, this is, we're going to be comfortable when we go over to AI. And can I just stop and let somebody know here today that I'm so glad that the Lord give us insight. We can learn from Israel. Can I get some help here? Because the Lord, not only did he break through the walls of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down, but I'm reminded of April 29th. Anybody remember April 29th? Where the Lord gave us a breakthrough. He allows us to build some walls up and to walk up into the church today. But here's the key thing that I need, that we need to learn. Don't, don't get comfortable in these nice pews. Can I get some help? Don't get comfortable in looking at these nice blue carpet and looking at the choirs. Amen. And it can be easy to come up into the house and say, you know what? Uh, I've got plenty of room to stretch out now. I think I'll take me a nap. I know y'all know how y'all I think I'm going to take me. I, 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 over there it was hot. It was hot over there on the other side, but I got plenty of room to stretch out. No, what we need you to do is play like you never prayed before. Can I get some help here? We need you to pray like you never prayed before. We need you to shout and praise God like you never praised God before because I believe that when God gives us something new, we ought to give something new back to him. Can I get some witness? And so we got to give him a new worship. We got to give him a new praise. And I believe that that's what this really is all about as we look again at what happened here in AI. Amen. And I believe that we can learn some lessons about AI that will help us to deal with defeat because there are some mistakes that we don't need to make. Anybody want to learn from your mistakes? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's see what the first lesson is. The first lesson is a review. If you were here two, two weeks ago, I talked about this lesson number one because the Lord gave the Israelites some instructions. He, and in the first lesson we need to learn, we must set apart and give to God that which belongs to God. So even before the Israelites went to Jericho, they were given specific instructions. The first thing God told them, destroy everything in the camp. Don't take anything for yourself. You destroy everything in the camp because the whole camp is a burnt offering unto the Lord. But he said, but there's one place, and this one place was Rahab's place. Y'all know Rahab's place. Y'all remember that? That's where all the fellas used to hang out. Y'all know, know Rahab's place, right? Rahab, Rahab was a prostitute. And wasn't it interesting to me that God would say out of all of this stuff going on, he said there were some liars, there were some cheaters, and there were some Johns that was out there. Can I give some help? But he said the only place where there were going to be salvation was going to be in Rahab's house. Amen. Well, Rahab, well, I think she would be a witness, but why was Rahab different? Well, let me share that with you. Rahab believed God's report. Can I give somebody else? Because she said, she said, I believe you guys are really coming from uh, fam, uh, the, the, the people. You are really people of God. And so she believed the spies and she hid the spies and that's why uh, Rahab's house was, uh, was saved. Now I want somebody to understand that Rahab chose to uh, the gift of God instead of the uh, wages of sin of death. And so the other thing that I see is the third thing he says, set apart everything that belongs to God and give it to God. Now, the first question that we have to ask, what belongs to God? And I happened to mention last time I, I talked about this, guess what? We belong to God. Right. Somebody say, I belong to God. Not only that, but you have a purpose behind your belonging. You have a purpose because you belong to God. You're in God's family. That means that you are set apart to do the things of God. And so don't anybody here leave here not understanding that you belong to somebody that's great. Can, I, can somebody go ahead and give great God praise now? Let me, hallelujah. Now, your, your, your physical family might not really be all that. Can I get some help? Your physical family might even not even know your name, but don't worry about that because you belong to a spiritual family, and that spiritual family is God Almighty. Can somebody go ahead and give God praise because you and I, what, belong to God. 
Not only do we belong to God, but our resources belong to God. Amen. Everything I got belongs to God. And then I said, not only that, but I talked about our worship and our praise belong to God. And that's why we cannot get comfortable. Some people will say, I just don't feel comfortable raising my hand. Well, ain't about you feeling comfortable. And say, amen, lights, amen, walls, amen. It ain't, about, it ain't about you when you come out to worship and praise. It's all about giving glory to the Lord God. And so we introduced some Hebrew words. I said, when, there's a Hebrew word called, somebody remember what I said? Hala, where we get hallelujah from. And that's how we can make a, a noise. It didn't even say make a joyful noise. Just make a noise. Amen. You ain't got to make no joyful noise. You ain't got to be on tune. You got to be on key. You just make a what? You can just make a noise. And then I talked about the Hebrew word of yada. Yada means the uh, bodily actions and gesture. You, don't, and you can move your arms. You can move your hands. No wonder why we have arms and legs. We can run around the church if we want to. Amen. Because that's all about yada praise. And I talked about zermar. Zermar was when we are praising God through instruments and through music and through song. But now, here's a new lesson. The new, the new lesson here. Sin can derail God's plan for you and your community. Let me say that again. Sin can derail your plans for you and your community. In verse number one, it says the Israelites violated the instructions about the things set apart for the Lord. There was a man by the name of Achan, and guess what? He did some things that caused a big problem, not just for himself, but for the entire camp. Let me talk about this man, Achan, because Achan, his Hebrew name means trouble. Amen, amen. And I'm wondering if there's anybody around here that got some, some people you hang around with. They may call them Bubba, but their name is Aiken. Yeah, they may call them Sue, but their real name is Aiken. Amen. And I, I don't want to mess nobody up, but I, I wonder if there's anybody here, when you looked in the mirror, you saw, your, you, saw you, but you really, your, your surname is Aiken. Amen. You, in other words, you cause some trouble. I can't get nobody in the house in a minute. You know, there's some people in here that cause trouble. And so uh, this is what Achan, Achan represented those who cause trouble in the camp. So the problem, the question I have, what was in Achan's mind when God had already told them not to take anything uh, that wasn't belonging to, uh, to, that belonged to God? Well, if you want to know what was Achan's mind, you have to look at Joshua 7 and 20. Am I going too fast? Y'all with me? Uh, 7 and 20 says, uh, and when they finally found out it was Achan, because Achan didn't volunteer to say that he had stolen something, but the process of elimination, they finally pointed to Achan, and Achan said, yes, I did sin against the Lord. He says, among the plunder, I, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, I saw 200 silver coins, and I saw a bar of gold that weighed a pound. And guess what? I wanted it. So what did I do? I took it. And then I took it and I hid it under, dug a hole under my tent. Now, Achan saw something that didn't belong to him, but he took it anyway. It was a beautiful robe. It was two, 200 silver coins. It was a bar of gold. He knew he didn't. It wasn't his, but he took it anyway because he didn't think nobody saw him. Can I get somebody to say, ouch, if I'm talking about you right now? So he didn't understand that this God who is in heaven, he, he sits high, but he looks low. They didn't know that this God in heaven, he's everywhere at the same time. Can I get some help here? And so he, he didn't know that God saw him no matter whether anybody else saw him or not. But I want you to know, my brother and sister, the problem that Achan had is he decided to disobey God's command. And can I just stop right here and say, brothers and sisters, let me share, share something with you. Stealing is still a sin. Yeah, sometimes we forget, we get so ca caught up in how to praise God and how to read the Bible and how to know all these translations and stuff. Can I share this with you? Stealing is still sin. Amen. And the reason I need to share that with you because uh, we are inundated today with information and ads and commercials. If anybody ever uh, watched TV tonight, I guarantee you there will be a car commercial on. There are going to be a car commercial saying, you can drive that car. There are going to be a jewelry. There are going to be clothing. That we are inundated with things as if things make us who we are. People think that if you get some things, you will have status. I know I'm talking to the right people because I see some people that are nodding their head. Amen. They think that things are going to change. But can I just uh, uh, share what the Lord says? He said it this way. For what profit a man if he would uh, uh, gain the whole world and guess what? Lose his soul. 
and I want somebody to know here today that what I'm trying to say here is cars and houses and, and, and clothes and jewelry will not make you. It doesn't make you a person. It will not make you important. It will not make you a high status. Let me tell you what it'll make you. Let me just share it with you. If you are an evil person and you get blessed with a house, now you're just an evil person in a house. If you're an ugly person and a mean person, you get a new Cadillac, well, you're driving that Cadillac, but you're still mean and, you know, what? And you might say, you know, if I can get all the, if you get some, if you are, if you, are, again, if you are a, a, a fool, <laughs> amen, and now you're just a fool in the house, in a car, but you're still the same fool you was before you got the, hallelujah, amen. Somebody going to get that here in just a minute. I need you to know that stealing, will, what, it, what, it, what you will become as a criminal, and you'll be a candidate for the prison system. That's what you're going to become. Now, I didn't just come to talk to people in the, about the world, in the world that, you know, there are thieves in the world, but can I talk to some good old church thieves? Can I, can I just talk to some good old church-going thieves? Can y'all don't mind me talking about some, some good church-going thieves? I, I, got some, I got some evidence now. I got some evidence. So don't, <laughs> I got some church-going thieves. Some will, will, will take things from the church they know does not belong to them, and they didn't get permission. You remember that dish that you really liked? You saw it at the homecoming, and you said, man, I got to have that dish. And somehow you thought you were picking up your dish. You knew you wasn't, but you, you thought you were. And you got your dish at home, and you put it up in the, in the cupboard. It, it belonged to you. You remember that? You, you remember when you were in the, you got, we had this big meal, and you really liked that cake, and you ended up taking half of the cake? You didn't ask no permission? I wonder if I'm talking to anybody. You remember when you borrowed that, those chairs and that table? It was supposed to be a return in about four, two or three days, and you've got it now in your garage, and now it's been over a year. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, my goodness. It's, yeah, so we, and I, and so, and I like the way the Lord says it. He said it this way. He says, you know, he said, will a man rob God? He already knew the answer to that. He said, yes, he has robbed me in what? Tithes and in offerings. He said, bring the tithe unto the storehouse. So all of us can, can, uh, can we got something here. We got some stake in this game right here as I talk about thieves. But I'm going to go another place. I'm, I'm sure we can all agree. Has anybody ever taken anything that didn't belong to you from your job? Yeah, you didn't ask for permission. You only needed one pen. You look in your drawer and you got 20 pens from the company. Come on. Not just pens. You got notebooks. You got uh, you got you got staple machines. Uh, you got uh, you got all kinds of tablets. You got everything. You know what? You didn't ask that man for that. So what you do? So all I'm trying to tell us is that we ain't as clean as we think we are. We ain't as, we ain't, we are not as innocent as we think we are innocent. And so there's a word for us because I want you to know in the 21st century this word is still real. Stealing is still a sin. Can I get some help in the house? He says Ephesians 4:28. Let the thief let the thief no longer steal, but rather let them labor doing honest work with their own hands, so that he may have something to share with others. We're living in a time now, and I want to make sure my young people understand this. Don't roll with no people who are thieves. Kick them to the curb right now. I, I don't go to no store. Don't try to pick up nothing that don't belong to you because all you're going to get is a prison record. Can I get some amen? Can the prayer by say amen? But if you work, if you stay in school, you work hard, I want to say, I'm going to tell you right now, God's going to bless you not only with a good job, but a good, some good money. And guess what? You're going to be able to bless the preacher because you're going to give your tithes. That's why I'm praying every day. Because I want to see some lawyers. I want to see some, I want to see you to be the best no matter what it is you are to be. Be the best that you can be. And I'm going to be pleased with it. I know God's going to be pleased. So we have to understand that we cannot, um, we cannot take things that doesn't belong to us. But there's another key here in this point, key point in this message. You must recognize how sin can derail God's plan for you and your community. It says here, the act of this one man caused trouble for the entire community. His sin affected the whole community of Israel. And can I just stop right now? Is that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but it just didn't impact you. It impacted your family. It impacted your community. And so, so and sometimes what we end up doing, we start complaining about the things that are not working right in this society, and we always like to blame God. I don't know why God gets all the blame. I heard people say, well, why did God let that little child die? Or why did God let that, you know, and a lot of times when we're blaming God, it's probably something that we did not do. 
Oh, you know, we ask the question, well, why did God allow uh, the, the hurricane to come? This is what I like. Why did God allow the hurricane to come and kill a lot of people? Well, some of those people should have evacuated. I mean, are you with me here? But all I'm trying to tell you here is let's not blame God. The reason that uh, we're in the mess that we're in is because of sin. Can I get somebody in the house to say amen? Is your sin and my sin the reason that we have problems in our homes, the reason we have problems in the White House, in uh, the State House, in the Prison House, in the, uh, in the School House, is because of what? Sin. And we have all fallen short of the glory of God. But I didn't come to point fingers at you because when I point fingers, I got three pointing at myself. But I came to give you some truth. Anybody want some truth here today? But this is the truth that will set you free. And it's in 1 John. It said, this is a message that we've heard from Jesus Christ. He said, God is light and he, in him there is no darkness. Let's get this straight right now. God is light. That means God is truth. God, there's no lying in him. God is real. There's no false in him. And he says, God is light. And then he says, if we say we have fellowship with Jesus and walk in darkness, guess what, y'all? We are lying. We are walking liars. Oh, let me go on back over here. But, 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 he says, if we say, uh, he said, if we have fellowship with him, we, are, we walk in darkness, we are liars. But if we walk in the light as Jesus is the light, then we have fellowship with one another. Here's one way to let you know that you're walking right because you can get along with some folks. You ever met anybody that can't get along with nobody? There's something wrong with believers and Christians who can't get along with nobody because they say if you walk in the light, then you have fellowship with one another. Uh, but he says if you say you have sinned, you have not sinned, you make him a liar. But here's the key right here. If we confess, anybody here want to go ahead and confess himself right now? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and guess what? And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we ought to go ahead and give God praise right there. Go ahead. That's a good time to give God praise that he's done it. So I want you to know that it's, it's about doing what's right. It's about doing good because that also impacts our family in a good way. We do good, and then it impacts our family. But there's another, uh, there's another lesson I want to share today, and this is the lesson that uh, we want to talk about in lesson number three. We must seek God's input before we plan our next steps. We must seek God's input before we plan our next step. So the problem with Joshua and the Israelites, is that they, they did it wrong when they went to Ai. They did it right when they went to Jericho. Because when you go and you look at uh, how, uh, what, did, what did Joshua do when he, went, when he conquered Jericho? He did a lot of right things. The first thing that he did, and we've already read it, is in Joshua 5.13. It says when Joshua was getting close to Jericho, he looked and saw a man standing in front of him. And this man had a sword in his hand. And Joshua said, are you a, a friend or a foe? This man said, I am the commander of the Lord's army. Some say he's Jesus Christ. And as, as this happened, Joshua fell on his face with reverence. In other words, what Joshua did, he's getting, ready to, he's getting ready to position himself for blessings. He's getting ready to position himself for breakthrough. What he does is that before what precedes breakthrough, what precedes blessing is worship. Because he falls on his face and he begins to worship the Lord. And he goes on and it says, they said, uh, he said, the Lord, the command of the Lord army said, take off your shoes for you're standing on what? Holy ground. This shows not only did he worship, but he also was obedient and he had humility. All of this precedes what God is trying to do for us in our next step. Y'all still here with me? Amen. amen. If you do say amen. 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 But the problem uh, came about because uh, what happened here is that Joshua did not go to the Lord when it came down to Ai. He didn't go to the Lord. He didn't ask for God's idea. He didn't ask for anything. Uh, and we see that in, in, this next in this next one. Joshua did not ask for God's input, but sent some men uh, to spy out a uh, AI. So here's what he's, I think Joshua said. We got this now, y'all. We're in the promised land, and we know how, G how the Lord did it before. All we had to do is show up, and they're going to fall down. 
Yeah, they, they, you know, we got this now. We know what we're doing now. We don't need God's help. We ain't in the talking to him now because we got, we got this now. I, can, I see what God is doing. I'm just going to show up and expect that the people are going to lay down. I can't get no help in the house here today. And so uh, uh, they began to make assumptions about, uh, about what God was going to do instead of checking themselves out and getting a relationship with God and talking it over with God. Now, here's the thing that we like to do. We like to start stuff and then ask God about it. We like to start stuff, and then we get in a mess, and we say, God, can you please bless this mess? God ain't going to bless no mess. You need to go back. You need to say, Lord, what have I done wrong? Get me out of this and help me to call on your name and understand your will and your way and pray to you and have a relationship with you every day. And then when I step out, I know I'm going to step out on solid ground. Is anybody else in the house in here today understand what I'm saying? And so they, they didn't do that. They made some assumptions that because God blessed them in Jericho that they had this now. They could walk in and everything was going to be done. So I came to tell you that uh, sometimes we fail to get God's advice on the front end of our plans. We make assumptions. Our assumption is this. Because I come to church, my plan is going to succeed. No. Uh, we make assumptions that just because I was raised in the church, then that means that everything is going to be all right in my life. No. We make some assumptions about, well, if I can do a quick prayer in the morning, a quick prayer at night, then everything ought to be all right. No, it don't work that way. Uh, do you, we make assumptions that just because we go to Bible study, we come to Sunday school, we are workers in the church, that everything's going to be fine. No, it don't work it that way. Because what you really understand, God is trying to create a, a connection with you that is tight, that is intimate, a step-by-step connection with you. And so I, I was trying to figure out, like, Lord, how can I explain this better? And he gave me the story. There's a story that goes that there, was, uh, there were some people who got stuck in an elevator. And they got stuck between two floors. And everybody in the elevator began to, to, to panic. They began to shout. They began to scream. They began to bl- bang, uh, bang on the side of the elevator. But guess what? The more they shouted, they got no attention. The more they screamed, they got no attention. The more they banged on the side of the, of the elevator, they didn't get any attention. But there was one man that was sitting in the back, and he was a little, uh, 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 he was kind of quiet. He walked over, and he said, oh, oh, look, I, I, need, I see there's a little door, and behind this little latch, there's a phone. So the man picks up the phone, and as soon as he picks up the phone, somebody says, can we help you? He said, yeah, we're stuck between two stories. And, and the security guy said, no problem, give me one minute. And as soon as the, 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 the elevator, uh, when he got a minute, the elevator came up to the next floor. And guess what? All the people got off safe. So you might be saying, well, preacher, what does it have to do with anything? Well, let me just slow you down here a bit because some of us are stuck in an elevator. Some of us are stuck in a bad situation. Some of us are stuck in bad relationships. Some of us are stuck in bad man mindsets. And some of us are stuck on stupid. I can't get no help here today. Some of us are stuck on bad plans. And some of us are stuck on bad ideas. And I think that we think that if we cry and moan and groan, we might get some attention. We just shout a little bit. We might get some attention. But I need you to know the problem that you have is not all your shouting. What you need to do is pick up the phone. Somebody say, pick up the phone. Somebody say, pick up the phone. Because when you pick up the phone, you got to call on the name of the Lord. When you pick up the phone, you got to call and understand that great Jihad is, is, is a great God in heaven. When you pick up the phone, you know that he's got your back. When you pick up the phone, you know he's Alpha and Omega. When you pick up the phone, you know he's the author and finisher of your faith. When you pick up the phone, you know that he's going to bring you out. When you pick up the phone, you know that you're going to get an answer because Jesus is on the main line. All you got to do is call him up and tell him what you want. But you can't pick up the phone every so often, every once in a while. No, you got to pick up the phone on a daily basis. And I guarantee you, my brother, if you begin to pick up that phone, you're going to see the Lord begin to bring some things to your bear. He's going to be able to open some doors for you. He's going to be able to make you uh, great in, in every way that you are planning. Somebody say, pick up the phone. And when you pick up the phone, then you need to be able to have an active and a, uh, a, build a vibrant relationship with the Lord. Pick up the phone and love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul and act like you do. Amen. Pick up the phone and ask God's opinions about things and let him lead you. Let him guide you. If you pick up the phone, somebody say pick up the phone. If you pick up the phone, you'll know that ain't no sense of being anxious for nothing. 
but in all things in prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. If you pick up the phone, you'll understand trust in the Lord with all that heart. Lean not unto thy own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him. And he shall what? Shall direct your path. If you pick up the phone, anybody in the house want to go ahead and give a call to the Lord right now? Pick up the phone. And when we call on the name of the Lord, he will answer. Don't anybody know he will answer? I don't, I don't care how late it is, he still will answer. And when he answers, he ain't going to give you no voicemail. He's going to pick it up and say, child, what do you need? Anybody in the house know that when you're in trouble, all you got to do is call on the name of the Lord. And can anybody say, I'm so glad that I learned a long time ago to call on the name of the Lord. Because when I call him, he will come through. Call on the name of Jesus and he will make a way out of no way. I'm so glad I learned to call him when I'm sick and I call him when I'm down. When I call him, when I say like I can't get it right, when I call on the name of the Lord and he will fix it. Uh, somebody say when he fix it, I'm going to go ahead and give God the praise. Uh, I'm not going to wait until he fix it, but I'm going to go ahead and say, Lord, I trust you right now. And I'm going to go ahead and give your name the highest praise uh, because you have been so good. Uh, you have been the one that stood by me. You have been the one that held me in the midnight hour. You have been the one that gave me life and strength. And I'm going to give your name. I'm going to give your name glory. I'm trying to get you to understand we're not talking about an activity we're talking about a relationship I want to see the I want to see those who use their phones the cell phones all the time let me see the hand just don't look around just go you know go and what you're doing is that you are keeping in touch with somebody you're texting them you are connecting with them God wants that same attention can I get some help here when you have that same attention let me tell you what's going to happen. When you, when you begin to connect with God that way, I don't care what you're trying to do, God will be in step with you. You don't have to ask him. He'll already tell you <laughs> because you're in connection with him. Give God praise. Give God praise. Amen. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is that the Lord will order the steps of a good person, and he will order your steps. And uh, we're so glad that the Lord will do that. The song says, order my steps in the Lord, and in your word, dear Lord, lead me, guide me every day. Send your anointing, Father, I pray, order my steps in your word. Humble, I ask thee, teach me thy will. Will you, while you are working, help me be still? Satan is busy, but God is real. Order my steps in your word. Please, God, order my steps in your word. And if there's one here today, that's what the preacher's trying to tell you. What you waiting on? I know you tried it on your own. You tried to go one way direction here and there. What you waiting on? God says, I got it right here. All I really need is somebody who's ready to listen, somebody who's ready to receive this. Relationship is what I'm preaching with the Lord. If you're here today and you're looking for something to happen in your life, Maybe you got a next step you're planning. You're not really sure what to do. Can I, can I slow you down right now and say, hold it, before you do anything, pray and fast. Fast and pray. And say, God, I want you to show me. I want you to teach me. I want you to connect me with the people that I need to connect with. I'm going to wait to hear from you hear from you. I'm going to step forward then. I'm going to go do what God has called me to do because I know it's going to work out. So the first step is to say yes to the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior King, if you haven't been baptized, would you please stand right now all over the building? Would you please stand right now all over the building? All over the building. Would you please stand right now? 